It was now ten days since my return, which we had celebrated according to the circumstances. In the windowless Isba, we were assigned for rest periods. We had emptied a five-quart container of ersatz no vodka, no biscuits. But then, that's war. In any case, we had reserved the ersatz for me and my friends. The rest of the company might as well have been in limbo. Beyond the boundary of our friendship, and indifferent to it, they washed their dirty feet in large dishes of faintly warmed water, or attacked their lice or organised lice races to pass the time. For a brief moment we felt a sense of occasion, but that quickly faded. One can tell the same stories only a certain number of times. We very soon sank back into the torpor characteristic of soldiers at the front. Nothing was new to us. We had been through it all before, and even on days when our morale was relatively high, we felt constrained by the inevitable anxieties of the front. For ten days we shuttled back and forth between our hole in the ground and the isba where we rested. Every twelve hours we tramped the half-mile which lay between our outpost and the shattered remnants of a village overrun by war. During the day we stared vacantly at the empty, frozen country beyond our hole. At night the fog limited our vision to ten or fifteen yards at most. We weren't yet trying to stop the enemy. Their front was still extremely fluid. From time to time a few attempts at penetration, always motorised, forced us to open fire. And once, since my return, enemy tanks had appeared and fired at our frozen batteries. Otherwise we had all the time in the world to observe the crystal structure of snowflakes against our infantry half-boots, which became as hard as wood during our twelve hours of duty, and softened again in the stable-like warmth of sixty bodies huddled together in the Isper during our twelve hours off. Fires, of course, were streng verboten, as smoke would give away our position. Wes Rydow often visited us. I think he felt especially warm toward our group and with the veteran, able to speak directly, as man to man. We young ones listened to them talking, the way boys listened to their elders, and what we heard was always alarming. Our exhausted troops had abandoned Kiev, which, in spite of everything, remained a centre of combat. We were still trying to hold the Dnieper, but even that famous barrage seemed to be doing us very little good. From Cherkasy to Kremenchug, the Russians were on both banks of the river. They also held both banks of the Desna. At Nedrigailov, victory was no longer a possibility for us, and our men were faced with a choice of captivity or death. Fortunately, as our front was extremely precarious and shallow, we were only supposed to be covering the southern wing of the fighting. The area we were holding was as flat as a billiard table, and a strong defence would have been difficult even with adequate supplies. On the twelfth day after my return, we were attacked by Russian planes, which cost us many casualties. Later that day, a column of German soldiers straggled over the horizon, partially made up of troops pushed from Cherkasy. Seven or eight ragged, famished regiments, overloaded with wounded, descended on us like a plague of locusts, ravaging and plundering our reserves. The intensity of the battle they had just survived could easily be read on their shaggy, exhausted faces. This fragment of the Wehrmacht, with worn-out boots, empty packs, and eyes glittering with fever, preceded by four days the Russian thrust which began at Kherson and pushed through to the west bank of the Dnieper. At precisely this moment, winter also began to attack in earnest. The thermometer suddenly plunged to five degrees below zero. On an evening of savage cold, the enemy reached our lines. The noise of their arrival preceded them, carried on the wind to the shivering bundles of rugs and blankets waiting behind frozen parapets. We listened as animals at bay listened to the pack closing in. For at least two hours we lay with straining ears, our enormous eyes staring fixedly through frozen films of protective tears. Although we could see nothing, voices kept announcing, Here they are! Our tense imaginations invested the visible edge of our defences with a thousand imaginary movements, and a thousand thoughts and visions whirled through our heads, our distant homelands, our families and friends, and our desperate, passionate loves. We imagined every possible outcome to the imminent fighting. Surrender, captivity, flight, flight or death. A quick death, to be done with it all. Some grasped their weapons all the more firmly, dreaming of a heroic defence which would push the Russians back and hold the line. But most of us were resigned to death, 
a resignation which often created the most glorious heroes of the war. Simple cowards or pacifists, who had been opposed to Hitler from the start, often saved their lives and the lives of many others in a delirium of terror, provoked by the accident of an overwhelming situation. Faced with the Russian hurricane, we ran whenever we could, but often we had no choice and became heroes without glory, who were somehow able to conjure up a strength superior to the enemies. We no longer fought for Hitler or for National Socialism or for the Third Reich, or even for our fiancés or mothers or families trapped in bomb-ravaged towns. We fought from simple fear, which was our motivating power. The idea of death, even when we accepted it, made us howl with powerless rage. We fought for reasons which are perhaps shameful, but are in the end stronger than any doctrine. We fought for ourselves, so that we wouldn't die in holes filled with mud and snow. We fought like rats, which do not hesitate to spring with all their teeth bared when they are cornered by a man infinitely larger than they are. Although we were already beaten ten times over, our terror became a fortress of despair, which the Russians found difficult to breach. We lay huddled against the frozen soil and listened to the growing tumult of their approach. We began to hear distinct, separable sounds. The black potato sack which was Hal's changed shape and moved toward me. Do you hear that? he whispered. They've got tanks. At first I heard nothing but tanks. Then there was the sound of singing too. A Russian victory song. It was their turn now to feel the infectious enthusiasm of advancing troops. A year and a half ago we were marching on Moscow, and I was singing just like that, muttered the veteran. The night wore on. The noise of the Russian advance changed in quality and intensity, but never stopped. The men who had been resting in the Isbas came back to their forward positions. Everyone was now in the line. Even the auxiliary services had been organised to defend the village. The front was long and thin. Our division alone held some sixty miles, with the regiments standing elbow to elbow. There were a great many of us, but at least thirty times as many of them. Our anxiety hovered over us like a pessimistic exhalation trapped by our heavy steel helmets. Our breath condensed on our nostrils and lips and on the upturned collars of our coats. For a long time now, our hands and feet had been hurting us. For the moment, stiffened by cold, they seemed detached and separate from our general nervous tension. On other evenings, the fellows moved about in their holes to keep from freezing. This evening, however, our cumbersome overshoes had been tossed aside, and everyone was still. The biting cold passed over us like a silent dream, depositing a film of frost on the earth and on us. Periodically we had to clear our weapons, and every time the touch of the icy metal struck us like an electric shock. To the east the Russian troops were silent. All we heard from their side was the disquieting roar of their engines. Occasionally we heard a horse whinnying, one of our starving beasts protesting the onset of death. The desire for sleep weighed on us as heavily and oppressively as our fear and the cold, and kept overwhelming us for five and even ten minutes at a time, despite our wide-open eyes. Then we would jolt back to reality, to wait for the first hours of morning, a time when men and animals often die of cold. The Russians were taking their time. Since we had caught the first sounds of their new front, a full day had gone by, but nothing more had happened. Had we possessed sufficient strength and equipment, a counter-attack would almost surely have been successful. But our orders were simply to resist and hang on. We were operating on a system of four hours on and four hours off, organised so that a maximum number of men was in the line at any given moment. Many men fell asleep beside their guns, to wake suddenly, badly frozen. We were steadily losing sick and wounded men, who withdrew on foot or on horseback, and no reinforcements were arriving to fill the gaps. It's a racket, grumbled the veteran. At dusk we found Lindbergh naked from the waist down. He had gone off a short distance, supposedly to crap, and had stayed that way for nearly three quarters of an hour. By the time we found him, he was crying like a baby, and he wouldn't have lasted much longer. Hals blew up at him and let him have it on the backside and thighs with the strap of his gas mask. By the next morning, the Russians had still not attacked. We had grown steadily colder and more nervous, and it was difficult to seem calm 
One of our planes flew over and dropped four sacks of mail. I had four letters, two from my family and two from Paula. All were very out of date, particularly one of the letters from France, which was more than a month old. I devoured Paula's letters, which seemed filled with sadness. She had been sent to a small factory out in the country some 40 miles from Berlin. She said that life in the capital was no longer possible. What was I supposed to think? What could I imagine? My parents' letter, with the standard two-line refrain from my father, irritated me by its tone of unjustified complaint. I mentioned this to Wiener, who replied, That's all the French know how to do complain. My mother's last letter astounded me by its lack of realism. The poor woman begged me to take care of myself, to avoid showing off, to do my duty, but nothing more, to protect myself from meaningless risks. This sort of advice seemed so irrelevant that for the moment I was staggered. I looked up from the letter, yellow against the snow, to the whiteness which veiled the appalling danger threatening us from the east. The pathetic futility of my mother's attitude made my eyes fill with tears. Everyone seemed to be reading a letter whose contents were so unexpected that fellows far older than I were overcome by tears. Others jumped to their feet, screaming like madmen. A close relative or friend had been killed in an air raid. This mail is only upsetting everyone, said a tall fellow next to me, as he looked at a friend who was weeping like a child. It seemed we were to be spared nothing. In the afternoon, some patrols were sent out into the whirling snow. Our command had grown tired of waiting and had decided to test the enemy. We heard a few shots and then the patrols came back, reporting that they'd seen a heavy concentration of Russian materiel. I and my comrades were wakened just before nightfall. With pounding hearts, we ran to our forward positions. The Russian tanks were rolling through the storm, and we could feel the vibration of their treads against the frozen ground. Our anti-tank gunners and men with Panzerfausts kept their eyes glued to their telescopic sights, which they had to wipe continually. A few anti-tank trenches had been dug, but these were ludicrously inadequate both in number and size. We knew that if our anti-tank defences gave way, we were lost, and we nervously clenched our fingers around the anti-tank grenades and magnetic mines which had been distributed. At the pack we were protecting, Olensheim, Balas, Freivich and others were ready to work the gun. Our visibility had been seriously reduced by falling snow. To the north of us, an SMG had just opened fire. The rumbling of tanks was louder than ever, but the tanks themselves were still invisible. To the north, fighting had already begun, and we could see flashes of light despite the thickly whirling snow and the rapidly growing darkness. Short bursts of anti-tank fire lashed the plane, producing a curious muffled echo. As the roar of tanks grew louder, we felt our lungs lift. Long flames ran the length of the horizon, while others rose vertically, illuminating at different levels the whirling masses of falling snow. Then the sound of tank engines in full acceleration shattered the night and our eardrums. Five vaguely defined monsters loomed out of the darkness, rolling parallel to our line of defence. Our anti-tank crew was already firing. Wiener calmly steadied the butt of his FM against his shoulder, and I felt myself stiffen with a thousand indescribable terrors. Flashes of yellow light burst against the lead tank in the group of T-34, whose turrets were pointed toward our line. Five shells had already left white traces on the huge machine, which otherwise appeared to be unaffected by the efforts of our anti-tank gunners. A tank was roaring past us at a distance of about ten yards. We heard a howling sound, and a shell from a Panzerfaust burst against its side. The monster immediately reduced its speed, and thick black smoke began to seep from every joint, to be lashed to the ground by the wind. The hatches opened, clanging back against the heavy metal plates. We could hear shouts and cries, which were quickly drowned by a powerful explosion. The turret disintegrated, leaving fragments of human beings suspended from the shattered metal in colours ranging from purple to gold. But there were no cries of triumph from our position. Only the barking voice of our pack. One of our shells hit a joint on the back of a second tank, and it too began to pour smoke. Then the cartridges were running through my fingers. Everyone who escaped from the immobilised tank was shot down without mercy.
For a moment we breathed more easily. By now our surroundings were lit by flames, and we were able to see the Russian tanks before they got so close. One of them had actually crossed our lines, and as it drew near us we could feel our hair stiffening with terror. The anti-tank crew were working as fast as they could. Within three seconds their gun was facing this new threat, and a shell, fired at the earliest possible instant, was bursting against the enemy's front apron. At the moment of impact, the engine stopped and then began to scream, as if it had been thrown out of gear. Simultaneously, somewhere to our right, we were aware of two brilliant flashes and heard a long drawn out explosion. Another tank began to fire at us, and large pieces of frozen earth hurtled into the air. I no longer knew what was happening. The tank to our right burst into flames, groaning at all its seams. Für den Panzerfaust, Sieg Heil, Heil! someone shouted. Our gunners were now firing at the second tank which had penetrated to our rear, and which seemed to be having mechanical difficulties. Then its left side disintegrated in a prolonged explosion. But our attention was drawn to a hallucinating spectacle farther to the rear. A T-34 had driven over one of our positions, crushing our men under its treads. One of our half-tracks, armed with an anti-tank machine gun, was chasing it from behind, firing as rapidly as it could. Our anti-tank crew were in trouble. Freivich was wounded, perhaps even dead. We fired our machine guns at the Russian monster, which never slackened its speed, but continued to make for its lines as fast as possible. Two shells fired by other tanks exploded beside our half-track, and a third disintegrated it right in front of us. But the enemy tank, believing it was still pursued, vanished into the whirling snow. The Russian armoured assault was over. It had lasted for about half an hour, and had clearly been testing our defences. A certain number of tanks had been disabled or destroyed. Their losses were visibly greater than ours. Unfortunately, these losses counted for nothing compared to the vast armada regrouping opposite us. For us, although quantitatively our losses were smaller, the destruction of four anti-tank positions in our sector was extremely serious. For the moment, the tension dropped somewhat. Trench telephones rang, asking for reports, and voices shouted for the stretcher-bearers who were running and sliding across the icy ground. The veterans slid to the bottom of our hole and lit a cigarette, despite the ban. Hals jumped down and joined us. I just heard that Wes Rydow's bunker was crushed by a T-34, he said, gasping. We gaped at him, waiting for more information. Stay here, the veteran said finally. I'll go and see. Achtung, Zigaretten, warned Hals. Danke. The veteran extinguished his butt and tucked it into the cuff of his sleeve. He reappeared half an hour later. We had to dig for ten minutes before we could get Wes Rydow out, he told us. He's all right, and so are the two other officers, just a few scratches. But the fellow from liaison outside was killed. He must have panicked and tried to get inside. We found his body in the rubble. We quickly suppressed that mangled vision to rejoice that our Hauptmann was safe. We all felt very attached to him and dependent on his survival. By next morning, the snow had stopped. The plain was strewn with the carcasses of wrecked tanks, which the storm had not entirely covered at least twenty in the immediate vicinity of our position. Parts of these huge black cadavers, still warm from the fires which had burned over and through them, had turned red in the intensity of the flames. It seemed that the Russians had attacked our line at four points, separated by intervals of fifteen miles. One of those had been centred directly on our position, which was held by six companies. The other three were farther to the north. We went back into the line at eight o'clock, Everything was motionless and muffled under a low, dark sky, as opaque and heavy as a lead roof. Nowhere else have I seen skies quite like the skies of Russian winter. We used to stare up, amazed by the oppressive solidity. The diffused light seeping slowly downward made everything look unreal. Our reversible winter overalls stood out against the immaculate new snow, a dingy piss yellow. A great many men were already wearing all the winter clothes we'd been issued, coat, vest, sheepskin, etc., which made their movements slow and clumsy. As the overalls had not been cut to cover so much bulk, they often tore. We looked like a collection of filthy, tattered pillows. Despite our sense of inferiority, we all felt much less tense. 
The carcasses of the Russian tanks looked to our otherwise pessimistic eyes like the slaughtered beasts of a triumphant hunting scene. We all knew that it had not been a serious attack. Nonetheless, we had managed to hold off the enemy's most dangerous machines. The possibility that the Russian tanks had been ordered not to advance any further occurred only to the veterans among us. All the younger men preferred to believe that we had stopped them. A few bottles of alcohol theoretically reserved for wounded men were opened by the captain himself, and that evening we celebrated in the Isbus. In our hut, we particularly honoured our Panzerfaust team. In the dim, wavering light of seven or eight candles, we drank to the healths of Obergefreiters Lenson, Kellermann and Dundee. Grenadiers Smellens and Prince touched glasses with Herr Hauptmann Vesreidau, who wore a large dressing on his left hand, and two others on his face. There were also two wounded men lying on stretchers, to whom we gave as many cigarettes as they wished. Hals, exuberant as always, was describing the battle, miming certain scenes with sweeping gestures of his left arm and hand, which held his glass, while with his right he vigorously scratched his armpits, which swarmed with lice. Lindbergh, as always when things were going well for us, was in a state of high excitement. Cowardice had affected him more than anybody else, and his face, although it looked as young as ever, bore the traces. Several men had fallen asleep despite the noise. Everyone who stayed awake was soon quite drunk. As always at a German celebration, several fellows began to sing marching songs, because we knew hardly any others. In the shadowy light of the Isba, the scene looked fantastic and unreal. The veteran began a Russian song. None of the rest of us understood him. We didn't know whether we were listening to a revolutionary song or a song from the friendly Ukraine. Although the distinction no longer mattered, as our Ukrainian days were over, everyone was singing whatever he liked, as part of a continuously increasing uproar. Hals had been twisting my arm to sing something in French, and I obliged, despite a growing desire to vomit, adding the Sombre et Meuse, and a series of more or less obscene songs to the general discord. Hals, who was as tight as a drum, burst out laughing and shouted, Here come the Franzos and to the rescue, Ora Pobieda. Then something disagreeable happened. Lenson stood up, stiff with drunkenness. Who the hell is talking about the Franz Osen? What can anyone expect from a bunch of lousy milk toasts like that? He was shouting at Hals, who was dancing heavily like a bear. Hals grabbed him by the arm and tried to pull him into a waltz. Shut up, you idiot, Lenson yelled. Go stick your head in the snow instead of belching out such crap. Hals, who was almost a head taller, went right on dancing. Then Lenson let him have it with his fists, shouting at him louder than his minuscule superiority of rank gave him any right to do. Still gestanden, gefreiter, he yelled. Who the hell do you think you are? Are you telling me to shut up? Hals was trying to stare at Lenson through eyes clouded by drink. Still gestanden, Lenson repeated, or I'll give you something you won't like. But you're forgetting, Sager. Hals shouted, waving at me. By now he was purple-faced too. He's half French, and he's lived in France all his life, and anyway, the French are with us now. He'd obviously been reading the same stories I had. You damned fool, where the hell did you get that? But it's true, someone else shouted. I read it in Ostfront. I no longer knew which way to look. Wake up, you dumb cop. So what if a handful of those milksops have come over to us? It doesn't mean a damn thing. And anyone who thinks anything different is no better than they are. Goddamned black-haired guitarists whining over their goddamned love gongs. I knew that Lenson was talking about the fundamental discord which has always existed between South Germany and Prussia. You're forgetting, Lenson, that my mother grew up just outside Berlin, I said. Well then, you've got to choose. Either you're German like us, or you're one of those worthless, feckless frogs. I was on the point of saying that, after all, I didn't really have much choice. And you were asked to make just that choice in Poland, even at Chemnitz. I remember. I was there. But he did choose, Hals shouted. And here he is, in the same boat as you and me and all the rest of us. So he doesn't have any more goddamn connection with the French. Lenson, who was unquestionably brave, 
had been awarded the Iron Cross after destroying his seventh tank. I suddenly felt overwhelmingly depressed and vulnerable, and incapable of ever attaining anything like Lenson's record. As always, I found the war almost totally paralysing, probably because of my soft French blood, which Lenson despised so much. I was really almost as bad as Lindbergh. He wasn't a true German either, but came from somewhere near Lake Constantion, of Lenson's typical black hairs. A joyous group had begun to sing Marienka, and general drunken revelry took over again. This time, though, I stayed on the sidelines, sunk in thought. All the pride I had felt when I had sworn my oath at Camp F, all my joy in feeling that at last I was the equal of my companions, for whom I felt an unquestioning respect, all the struggles and miseries undertaken and endured with the burning faith of a true believer. All of these had been once again cast into doubt by Lenson's drunken outburst. I had always sensed a certain scorn on his part. However, once in Poland he had come to my defence, and I had jumped to the conclusion that he held nothing against me on account of my origins. Now I knew the truth. Despite all my efforts and all the suffering we had been through together, my comrades rejected me. Would they ever think me worthy of bearing German arms? Inwardly, I cursed my parents for having brought me into the world at their particular crossroads. I felt angry and sad and incredibly alone. I knew that I could count on Hals and Wiener and maybe a few others, but even they had started drinking and singing again, beside their blood brothers. I would never again be able to sing with a light, casual spirit those German songs I enjoyed so much. And some day, maybe very soon, I might die, in a position not much better than that of an adoring black slave at his master's side. This vision of things was unbearable, and increased the nausea brought on by alcohol. I went outside to vomit and take a few breaths of icy air. My drunkenness prevented any further thought, and when I returned to the hut, I collapsed onto a heap of packs to scratch at the lice biting me under my belt. The next morning, the Russian front began to move again. First, they sent over a few rounds of artillery. They had been keeping us in a state of expectation for several days now, undoubtedly preparing a definitive offensive with the slowness characteristic of their organisation. During the day, we were reinforced by an artillery column, which meant digging new trenches and blistered hands for all of us. All along the front, our troops were ordered to break up the Russian positions. That afternoon, we pounded the enemy with our big guns. They remained obstinately quiet. As soon as it was dark, certain sections loaded with ammunition left our trenches and advanced across the snowy ground. We had resumed our push to the east. Shy, sir! In a state of considerable apprehension, these groups fell on a motorised Soviet regiment, whose mass of vehicles seemed immobilised for all eternity. The night stillness was broken by the sound of our FM and grenades, the cries of the Russians, surprised by this sudden and unexpected display of aggressiveness, and the roar of incendiary bombs, which must have consumed a costly quantity of material. Then our men made a half turn, before the Russians were able to muster an organised reaction, and ran back to our trenches, bathed in transitory glory. We had in fact aroused the anger of the Russians, who decided to retaliate as soon as it was light. As at Belgorod, the whole horizon burst into flame, with the sudden total involvement of the opening bars of a Wagner opera. Our frantic dash to our positions assumed a tragic quality, as the rain of fire was so dense that a quarter of our men fell before they'd reached the line. Then we relived scenes and experiences very like what we'd known before. The sight of comrades screaming and writhing through final moments of agony had become no more bearable with familiarity, and I, despite my longing to live or die a worthy hero of the Wehrmacht, was no less of an animal stiff with uncontrollable terror. Fortunately for us, the Luftwaffe, on which we could no longer rely, made an unexpected appearance and somewhat reduced the force of the Russian blow. But the next day this intervention was answered in kind, and Russian planes did what they could to knock out our artillery. As a result, our artillery was withdrawn during the night, leaving us to do the honours unsupported. We held our positions for four more terrible days, in spite of continuous infantry attacks supported by armour. Whenever possible, we buried our dead in the holes where they fell. Eighty-three names were scratched off the company list among these, 
Ollensheim, who had recovered from a serious wound at Belgorod, to receive his coup de grace here on the west bank of the Dnieper, where tranquility was to have been assured. The Russians had finally regrouped for their supreme effort and were delaying only to complete last-minute preparations. Their artillery, which seemed to be growing stronger by the hour, pounded our positions and the countryside for a long way back. The veteran had just been wounded and was waiting, along with some hundred other men, for evacuation to a hospital, or at least to a quieter zone in the rear. A brusque sergeant had taken Wiener's place, and I continued to feed ammunition into the Spandau, operated by someone considerably less expert than my friend. The night which followed was so horrible that I retain only a confused and fragmented memory of it. Fresh supplies of ammunition were often slung into a length of canvas and carried across the trenches by two or four fellows. The night of which I speak was, of course, total by five in the evening. Time in Russia is like that. In the summer there is almost no night, and in the winter no day. We had just withstood two or three major assaults. From the screams of anguish to our left, we concluded that a great many of our men had been killed. We had emptied five magazines and were warming our fingers on the hot metal of the machine gun. Our sixth and last magazine had been attached and we were anxiously waiting for fresh supplies. The night was continuously lit by the explosions of thousands of Russian shells, which made movement extremely difficult. Our trenches, which in any case were not deep enough, extended only to certain positions. The others had to be reached by leaps and bounds, alternating with plunges to the ground and writhing on our stomachs across dozens of yards of snow mixed with chunks of frozen earth. From time to time we could see four figures moving toward us, jumping from crater to crater, carrying shells for our 50 mm mortar and magazines for the Spandau. They were still about 40 yards away when their shadowy mass was surrounded by a flash of white light. We never heard any cries. A few minutes later, I was sent out to crawl to the point of impact. The sergeant ordered me to bring back at least two magazines. I had just arrived at my destination when I heard the Russian assault cry, followed by a shower of grenades and mortar shells. The ground shook beneath me in a manner which defied all prediction. I felt like a pea inside a ferociously beaten drum. I was lying flat on the ground among the bodies of comrades killed only a few minutes before, unable to see any of the supplies I'd been sent to fetch. Then I heard the sound of a tank. The darkness all around me was broken by streaks of light and large pink and yellow explosions. In a momentary beam from some headlight, I could see a small sign marked S-157. I opened my mouth wide as prescribed because I could hardly breathe, and lay where I was, frantically groping for something to hang on to in that diabolical setting, where horizontal and vertical alternated to the rhythm of the lights which slashed the darkness. I thought that I could recognise through the uproar the crackle of the weapon I had operated with Wiener, and had left only a moment before, and felt that my sanity might be close to collapse. I could see no escape from my situation, and lay glued to the ground with my head down, like a trussed animal, waiting for the butcher's axe. A hundred yards to my left, the pack, with its barrel marked for eleven kills, was fleeing into the striped darkness with its ammunition and gun crew. I heard the terrifying roar of a tank rising above the general tumult, and a headlight wavered and leaped through the undulating darkness. It had obviously driven through our defences, and was now passing within twenty yards of where I lay. I saw it suddenly burst into flame, and despite the intense cold, a wave of hot air almost asphyxiated me. Half unconscious, I could hear the trample of running feet all around me, and despite the noise of guns and explosions, cries which sounded more like curses than anything else, and were certainly neither French nor German. I thought I could distinguish three or four pairs of boots thumping past me. Everything happened so quickly at that moment that I am no longer sure of what in fact I did see. I could still hear the sound of a machine gun, and then there were hundreds of shouting voices. The tank exploded a second time, showering steel fragments all around me. Some of our soldiers must still have been firing. Then there was a period of relative calm, which lasted for about three quarters of an hour. Exhausted by nervous tension, I managed to pull myself out of my torpor enough to take a few steps toward the position I had left twenty minutes earlier.
but nothing remained of it except smoke and motionless bodies. Furthermore, the entire sector, as far as I could see, was veiled in smoke. I turned back again, heading for our rear lines, and, too late to stop myself, tripped over a corpse. I realised that I had no weapon, and grabbed the dead man's gun, which was lying beside him. Then I began to run. I heard four or five shots. The whistling flight of the balls made me think of hell. I knew that I might faint at any moment, and between two spasms of nausea fell into a hole, where three fellows in roughly the same state as myself were staring fixedly at the dark, sombre east. Literally crumpled into the bottom of the hole, I attempted to order my thoughts. My retina still bore the imprint of a thousand darting luminous points, which prolonged my sense of vertigo. For a long moment I stayed where I was, wondering where to head for next. Then I heard the other fellows in the hole exclaiming with astonishment, Far to the south, the earth seemed to have caught on fire, and the sky rang with the sound of thunder. Twenty miles to the south, the second Dnieper front had given way in the face of irresistible Russian pressure, and thousands of German and Romanian soldiers met an apocalyptic end. Some twenty regiments had been unable to disengage in time, and had laid down their arms, to be rewarded for their bravery by captivity and degradation. For the rest of us, the war continued. In a rush, I decided to leave the hole which had received me a few moments before. Doubled over, I ran like a madman to another defensive position, where a group of soldiers were clustered around a motionless figure who was being bandaged. A fellow I didn't recognise hailed me by name. Where have you come from, Sager? My head was still pounding to the rhythm of the bombardment. I stared at him. I don't know. I don't know anymore. Everyone back there is dead. I ran away through all the Russians. Behind us we could hear the roar of an engine. A tractor was pulling a heavy anti-tank gun into position. Then we heard the burst of the exhaust a moment before each shell exploded. Our overwhelming weariness was now affecting us like a drug. Russian shells were coming over in profusion. For a moment we watched the storm closing in. Then, with a cry of despair and a prayer for mercy, we dived to the bottom of our hole trembling as the earth shook and the intensity of our fear grew. The shocks, whose centre seemed closer each time, were of an extraordinary violence. Torrents of snow and frozen earth poured down on us. A white flash, accompanied by an extraordinary displacement of air and an intensity of noise which deafened us, lifted the edge of the trench. None of us immediately grasped what had happened. We were thrown in a heap against the far wall of the hole wounded and intact together. Then, with a roar, the earth poured in and covered us. In that moment, so close to death, I was seized by a rush of terror so powerful that I felt my mind was cracking. Trapped by the weight of earth, I began to howl like a madman. The memory of that moment terrifies me still. The sense that one has been buried alive is horrible beyond the powers of ordinary language. Dirt had run down my neck and into my mouth and eyes and my whole body was gripped by a heavy and astonishingly inert substance which only held me more tightly the harder I struggled. Under my thigh I felt a leg kicking with the desperation of a horse between the shafts of a heavy cart. Something else was rubbing against my shoulder. With a sudden jerk, I pulled my head free of the dirt and of my helmet, whose strap was cutting into my windpipe, nearly strangling me. Some two feet from my face, a horrible mask pouring blood was howling like a demon. My body was still entirely trapped. I knew that I was either going to die or lose my reason. My throat burst with screams of rage and despair. No nightmare could possibly reach such a pitch of horror. At that moment, I suddenly understood the meaning of all the cries and shrieks I had heard on every battlefield, and I also understood the marching songs, which so often begin with a ringing description of a soldier dying in glory, and then suddenly turn sombre. We marched together like brothers, and now he lies in the dust. My heart is torn with despair. My heart is torn with despair. Once again I learned how hard it is to watch a comrade die, almost as hard as dying oneself. During the night, the Russians made nine attempts to break through our lines, and failed. If they had persevered once, or maybe twice more, they would surely have been successful. I watched, three quarters buried, for about twenty minutes, while a hurricane of fire broke over our rear, 
destroying what was left of the village and killing something like 700 men in our regiment alone, which at the beginning of the offensive had numbered about 2,800 men. I scratched at the ground with my hands and somehow managed to free myself. Two men were lying beside me dot in pools of blood. The dying man had been buried under more than a yard of earth and could no longer hope for anything but the mercy of heaven. A fellow beside me who had been wounded was groaning with pain. He was buried almost as deeply as I had been. I dug him out as fast as I could and helped him to crawl through the explosions toward the rear. On the way, I saw a gun lying on the ground and picked it up. The rest of the night was consumed by a series of almost insuperably difficult problems, as if we were caught in a terrible game with all the odds against us and our lives at stake. At dawn, in the first faint light of a dark winter day, the front grew quiet. The scattered remnants of our regiments collected as they met among the craters and shell holes. A cloud of stale smoke hung over the snowy ground, which was littered with Russian and German dead. The wounded, who had not yet succumbed to the bitter cold, were still groaning, filling the air with a chorus of misery which our exhausted ears heard as they might have heard a winter wind howling over the roof of an isba in an isolated hamlet on the steppe. Sections were organised to help the stretcher-bearers with a job of impossible magnitude. As always, the Russians left all rescue efforts to us. Their wounded were left lying where they fell, with a possibility of either dying on the spot or of being picked up by one of our first aid teams. Their supplies of material seemed to be increasing daily in quantity and quality, but their medical services barely functioned. As our army grew more and more disorganised by retreat, we became increasingly unable to care for the thousands of wounded soldiers, whose number was continuously growing. The Russian wounded could hope for very little from us. While the medical service tried to deal with the wounded, some twelve of us settled into a half-covered bunker back of our former sleeping quarters, which had been entirely destroyed. Herr Hauptmann Vesraidau, who had just arrived, was one of the group. Despite a general sense of foreboding in the face of disaster, we all felt a surge of joy whenever a particular friend appeared. Hals, Lenson and Lindbergh were all there. I was helping a wounded corporal bandage his severely burned right hand when the captain announced that we would retreat. He sent us out to help the non-coms count off and regroup our decimated company before moving camp at dawn. I went with Lenson to help him find what was left of his section. The Russians, who had also taken a beating, were catching a moment's rest before demolishing what remained of our front. For the moment, everything was quiet in the eerie half-light of December. Lenson couldn't quite grasp what had happened to me. For him, the simple fact that I had survived the Soviet thrust was extraordinary. My explanations that at the time I had understood nothing made no difference to him. He simply supplied his own scenario. My winter overalls had entirely disappeared, leaving me with nothing but my singed overcoat. During my flight, I had picked up a gun which proved to be Russian. For Lenson, it was all clear. The Russians had overrun my position and had either failed to notice me or had taken me for dead. In a desperate man-to-man -man struggle, I had managed to wrest a weapon from one of them and with his gun had fought my way to our lines. You're still stunned, he insisted, but I'm sure you'll remember later. I don't see any other explanation. Lenson's version certainly had its advantages. I myself retained nothing but a chaotic impression of flashing lights and thunderous noises over a sense of such total disorientation that I had no longer been capable of distinguishing east from west or up from down. Perhaps Lenson was only trying to compensate for his attitude during our evening of celebration. At dusk, which fell in the middle of the afternoon, the German army abandoned the second Dnieper front. While the immense Russian thrust whose fringe had swept over us was pressing with its principal strength against German and Romanian units further to the south, our depleted columns withdrew from their positions, abandoning all material which was no longer usable or transportable. Our gross Deutschland regiments, half of us on foot, left in relative silence, our backs bent by the weight of our burdens, hoping that the grey skies would hold back for a while longer the rain of metal and fire which the pursuing enemy was bound to send after us. Our prayers were granted and we were able to march for 30 miles undisturbed.
We were unpleasantly surprised to find no reserve positions in that distance, except for a few surveillance posts where the fellows to their astonishment were told to pack up and leave with us. We encountered no serious defensive efforts. The Russians could easily have continued their advance without firing a shot. On the second day of this third retreat, the most mobile portion of our battalion stopped and settled in to act as a covering force, while the rest continued westward. Some 2,000 men, among them myself, were stationed near a village which was not marked on any of the staff maps. As we arrived, the inhabitants fled into the thick forest. We established ourselves with light but motorised weapons. We had four minuscule tanks, which had been effective in Poland but were like toys compared to the T-34. Their armament consisted of a double-barrelled machine gun and a grenade thrower, and we used them principally as tractors to pull the twelve sleighs which made up our train. Four half-tracks doubled as anti-tank machine gun posts, and as a source of emergency power for our six trucks when they stuck in the deep snowdrifts. Three enormous Zundap Rusland sidecars skated through the powdery snow, which often plugged the space between the front mudguard and tyre, preventing that wheel from turning. Their engines were powerful enough to free the back wheel and the wheel of the sidecar, which was also motorised, and send the whole machine zigzagging forward, roaring from its twin exhausts, while the blocked driving wheel skated over the surface like the runner of a sleigh. Three packs completed our defence. With these weapons, which were suitable for chasing partisans, and the classic infantry weapons PM, mortars, FM and grenades, we had been ordered to stop three Russian divisions, including several armoured regiments, for at least 24 hours. Lastly, our orders were to withdraw, even if our efforts should be triumphantly successful. Throughout our sector, whose front was roughly 60 miles long, groups analogous to ours were left behind, while the main body of troops withdrew to the west in a series of forced marches. The Russians, who had broken through further south, neglected our sector. There was no need for them to take any more losses pursuing an enemy who was withdrawing anyway. The Red Army left our harassment to the partisans, whose numbers were continuously increasing, and which soon reached proportions astonishing in a country nominally under our control. On Stalin's orders, they intensified the desperation of our retreat with sudden ambushes, shells with delayed action fuses, booby-trapped and mutilated bodies of men from interior positions, attacks on supply trains, isolated groups and rallying points, hideous mutilation of prisoners, and a constant refusal of contact with units capable of fighting. The partisans, or terrorists, a name they richly deserved, always took on easy victims and greatly intensified the usual cruelties of wartime. By these means, they achieved an effect which the regular army was never able to equal. The Wehrmacht bent before the power of an incomparably greater enemy. The unbearable harassment by partisans was added to the overwhelming and heroic rigours of the front, while our territories in the rear no longer guaranteed any repose to our exhausted troops. The Ukraine, which had shown some sympathy for us, was itself pillaged by partisan bands on orders from Moscow. The Ukrainian population had to choose and be actively for one side or another. The partisans either killed or enlisted the young Ukrainians, who had until then been so respectful to us. The invisible war triumphed. War which no longer offered any retreat or calm or pity. Wars of subversion have no face, and like revolutions create their own martyrs, innocent victims and hostages, and provoke confused judgments of ill-considered actions. Men kill for revenge, in reprisal for what has happened or might happen. The partisans were pouring oil onto a huge conflagration. In the name of Marxist liberty, the Ukraine was forced to alter its attitude. German and Ukrainian alike grew bitter and full of hate. The war became a total war, a war of scorched earth, offering the towns and villages in its path no more relief than we would eventually receive when we became the vanquished. In this period, as the war attained the most violent paroxysms of an already unbearable conflict, our unit sat out its sentence of round-the-clock guard duty in the murderous cold. Over the snow-covered ground, silence hung, unbroken except for the occasional howl of a grey tiger wolf deep in the forests, which were still largely unexplored. A quarter of our men were always on guard, 
watching from the shelter of ludicrously inadequate fortifications or frost-covered tank turrets, or mounting hurried patrols at the edge of the forest. The rest waited in the abandoned isbas. The stoves in these huts had been systematically destroyed before we arrived, no doubt by partisans, who hoped that without shelter we would die of cold. Some of the isbars were open to the sky, with their roofs burned or pulled off. Probably the partisans had not had time to destroy the village completely before we arrived. There were far too many of us for the number of buildings still standing, and hundreds of men were reduced to finding what shelter they could, huddled behind gutted walls, whose only roof was the heavy, opaque fog. Inside the walls, these men burned everything they could find. In the better Isbas, the intense flames threatened to set fire at any moment to the structures themselves. Our exhausted troops no longer bothered to collect deadwood from the forest, and burned every combustible fitting left in the huts. Cursing at the smoke which blinded them, and which in the roofed Isbas escaped only through the open doors, our soldiers, packed closely together for warmth, tried to sleep on their feet, despite the coughs which shook their bodies. In the Isbas without roofs, smoke was never a difficulty, but the men were never warm. Those closest to the fires rapidly grew so hot they had to move, while others, only four or five yards away, felt only the faintest warming of the air, whose temperature rose to 15 or 16 degrees above zero. Every two hours, another quarter of the men went back to the dugouts to make room in our precarious sleeping quarters for those who would return white with cold. The winter was now serious, 15 degrees below zero, according to the thermometer of our radio group. As before, our general state of filth aggravated the situation. Any desire to piss was announced to all present, so that hands swollen by chillblains could be held out under the warm urine, which often infected our cracked fingers. I was taking my first tour of guard duty in the early morning hours of polar darkness, and my second began at one o'clock in the diffused light of midday, which was veiled by a sky as dark as the sky over Tempelhof the day it was destroyed. Toward the end of my patrol, the day would turn an unusual pink. By three o'clock, when I returned to the smokehouse, there was nothing further to report. My eyes hurt me and my nose was so inflamed by frostbite I could no longer bear to leave it uncovered. We hid our faces like Chicago gangsters, with our collars raised and tied around our faces with scarves or strings. An hour later, the pink light turned violet and then grey. The snow turned grey too, and then it was dark from mid-afternoon until nine the next morning. With darkness, the temperature always plunged sharply, often to 35 or 40 degrees below zero. Our material was paralysed, gasoline froze, and oil became first a paste and then a glue, which entirely blocked the mechanism. The forest rang with strange sounds, the bark of trees bursting under the pressure of the freezing. Stones cracked only when the temperature fell to 60 degrees below zero. For us, the horror we had been dreading for so long had arrived. Winter at war, a reality we had almost forgotten, fell on us like the die of a gigantic press ready to crush us. Everything combustible was burned. A lieutenant defended two of our sleighs with a gun against some forty lancer, whose breath rattled through their congested lungs. The nose of every face cover developed a block of ice which grew larger as each fresh breath condensed and froze. We want the sleighs for wood, the men shouted. Get back, the lieutenant screamed in reply. The forest is full of wood. The lancer stared at him, wondering what good the sleighs would do them if they all froze. A party sent out to fetch wood from the forest ran to the shelter of the trees. Faceless spectres returned with bundles which they threw down onto the dying fires. The fires had to be kept alive, which made rest impossible. We prayed that the Russians wouldn't attack. All attempts at defence had been abandoned. Guard duty was the hardest of all. To stand still, one seriously risked being frozen alive. At nine o'clock, it was my turn again. Fifteen of us were standing watch in the ruins of a building crusted with hard snow, which cracked like glass. We got through the first half hour beating each other to keep our blood moving. The second half hour was torture. Two men fainted. We thrust our stiffened hands from our sleeves and clumsily tried to help them. Our gloves, part wool and part leather, 
were already full of holes and good for nothing. The pain in our hands and feet seemed to travel through our bodies and clutch at our hearts. Four men carried the unconscious soldiers to the fires which gleamed in the darkness. If the Russians had come, they could easily have wiped us out. One man was running round and round in small circles, crying like a baby. The pain in my feet made me scream aloud. Despite orders, I abandoned my post and ran to the nearest izba. Shoving my way through a compact mass of soldiers, I stopped just short of the fire and fell grimacing to my knees. Then I thrust my boots right into the coals. They immediately began to crackle and hiss, and at the pain of contact between hot and cold, I burst into loud sobs. I was not the only one to cry, and there were others whose screams and moans were far louder than mine. The hour of release finally came, and we prepared to leave. The Russians had not swarmed down on us, and the steel of our frosted weapons, which had not been heated by explosions, glimmered bluer than ever in the horrible cold and looked as brittle as glass. Our men assembled listlessly, torn by a conflict of disloyalties which brought them close to madness. Although no one had covered himself with glory fighting against the Russians, another fight, which was equally formidable, had been fought against the cold and our exhaustion and filth and the lice we scarcely felt, they had become so much a part of our everyday condition. The cold had also claimed its victims. Three times, detachments of the last group on guard had returned to the fires carrying inert bodies. Pneumonia, generalised frostbite, and physical weakness had been unable to resist the overwhelming cold. For three men, their return to the fire came too late. Five others were revived by flagellation and alcohol. In the motionless cold of the polar night, we covered the rigid corpses with snow, marking each improvised grave with a stick and a helmet. There was no time for sentiment or reflection. Those who were still to their astonishment among the living were trying to shake off the general numbness enough to start our solidly frozen engines. The situation seemed desperate. Not one of the engines turned over. Feldwebel Spolovsky stamped down on the pedals of his Zundap, which resisted the pressure his 190 pounds of flesh and bone could still bring to bear, and then cracked like a piece of dead wood. The metal itself seemed to be affected. We lit fires under the panzers, to try to thaw them slowly before making any attempt to start them. For the cursing, gasping Lancer, the effort was immense, straining our congested lungs, which whistled and rattled. Wesraidao himself was impatient. He had wrapped his boots in rags picked up during the retreat. We should have kept at least one engine running all night, he exclaimed. It's elementary. This sort of carelessness could ruin all of us. We listened to him with expressionless faces. Undoubtedly, several among us would have regarded death as a deliverance. An hour or so later, we heard the asthmatic backfire of an engine. Someone had managed to start one of the half-tracks. The driver let it warm up for a while and set to work on the gearbox, which had not yet thawed. After two hours of intense effort, our column set out, under orders to maintain the lowest possible speed. Until the machines had reached a certain minimum temperature, we had to limp after them on foot. At midday there were several breakdowns, and the convoy had to stop. The radiator hoses of several vehicles had been damaged by the pure alcohol in the radiators, and we had to repair them, using spare parts if we were fortunate enough to have them. Otherwise, we patched them up as best we could. While the work was in progress, we opened some cans of solidly frozen food, meat which could be chopped with an axe, a puree of peas and soya with the consistency of cement, and a solid brick of wine. Our enforced stop cost us an hour. According to radio instructions, we had one more hour to rejoin the main body of troops. We were crossing the territory of one of our interior defence posts, two round blockhouses and three or four huts built into the ground. No one came out to meet us, and the place seemed deserted. However, a plume of smoke was rising from one of the blockhouses. No doubt the men inside were asleep beside a warm fire. We sent a small group over to investigate. Five minutes later, one of them ran back to the column, his breath spreading around his face in white clouds. When he reached us, he stopped, gasping. Everything in there has been destroyed, Herr Hauptmann, and everyone is dead. It's terrible. Every grey face filled with anxiety. Looking more closely, we saw that the doors of the Isbus had all been knocked in, 
and that four or five bodies lay beside one of the huts. Partisans, someone shouted. Six men recently killed. There's been fighting here recently, Herr Hauptmann. Those bandits must still be holding their guns. Another detachment went into the second blockhouse. There was a long, echoing explosion, and a geyser of earth and snow and fragments of wood shot into the air over the building. Vesraidao cursed aloud and ran toward the smoking bunker. We followed him. Three men had just been torn to pieces. Two were unrecognizable, while the third was gasping his last breath, rattling as the blood spurted from his body. Mixed into the rubble lay the bodies of four German soldiers who had been killed before we arrived. Watch out for mines! Vesraidao shouted. The word passed from mouth to mouth. Soldiers stopped at the door of the second blockhouse and looked in without daring to enter. Six men, who had been stripped almost naked and hideously mutilated, were lying in pools of black congealed blood. Some of the mutilations were so horrible that we couldn't look at them. Two soldiers' men who had fought outside of Moscow, at Kursk, Bryansk and Belgorod, and seen appalling horrors, hid their faces in their hands and walked away. None of us had ever seen anything so gratuitously horrible. Taking infinite precautions, a section removed the cadavers. Two of them had been booby-trapped. We covered their bodies with debris, as we had neither the means nor the time to dig graves. To all of us, the tactics of the partisans seemed more ignoble and senseless than anything else we'd seen. Vesraidao led a ceremony of final farewell to the 18 massacred men. We removed our hats and caps and helmets and stood bareheaded in the snow. Ich hatte einen Kameraden, 